Hello? Hi. Hi. Hi again. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, I've opened up that 2017 paper that you sent me. Uh, and have you guys had a chance to look at it? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, shall we make our way through it then? Okay, let's let's start with question one then. So is it just Grace and Kanako there, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay, we'll start with you, Grace, then. Can you give me the answer to question 1A? Um, yeah, can I just, do you want us to tell you what we wrote, or? Uh, it's, it's your choice, guys. So if you tell me what you wrote, I can tell you what mark I you'd get for that, or you can talk me through what you think the answer would be. It's your choice. Okay, cool. Um, so basically what I've said is that you can consider biodiversity within an ecosystem and okay. also consider it within the gene pools of species okay. and also by the number of different types of species that are out there. Good, okay. So you get both marks there. So there's four marks to be had. Um, you could talk about um, the variation in or the diversity of the ecosystems, talk about the number or, or the variety of the species uh, and the rel relative abundance of each species. And the last thing you can comment on is gen genetic diversity. So if you talk about any of those four points, you'll get you'll get a mark for each one. Uh, so you get both marks for that. Hanako, what did you write for that? Sorry? What, Hanako, what did you write for 1A? Tell me. Um, I said diversity of habitat and species and the abundance of species and genetic diversity within that species. Okay, let's go to part B then. Is it, can I just ask something over here? Yeah. Is it okay if we're using different words to the masking? For example, the fact that I said um, diversity can be considered within the gene pools of species. Yeah, you still get the mark. Okay. Uh, so, cool. give me the answer for this. So, state two sources of genetic uh, environment factors and the change gene sequences. Yeah, okay, good. Do you both understand that? So, genetic factors and environmental factors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So they don't, how do we know that they don't want an example of, for example, environmental factor and a genetic factor? So they've only asked you to state two sources of the variation. You could give examples here. They wouldn't mark you down for that. But the clue is, well, the fact that the question specifically asks you to give the sources as opposed to, um, you know, examples of sources. I guess it is a little bit vague, but I think for me, the fact that it's one mark kind of tells you that they're not looking for examples here. Okay. But if you did give examples, you wouldn't be marked down for that. Mm -hmm. As long as you make it very clear that you're talking about genetic and environmental. Yeah. Um, all right. So just one reason why it's difficult to measure the actual population size is as well. Oh, Grace, do you want to give me that answer? Um, they're, they're big and they move around. The ocean's big and they move around, so it's going to be hard to count how many more. Yeah, okay. So you can talk about how the fact that they migrate, what you're saying is move around. Um, but yeah, talk about the fact that they migrate, they're mobile. The fact that they inhabit a huge area, so these whales will you know, live in huge oceans, which is hard to track them, and the fact that they live at great depth. So there's three points there and you can state one of those. Okay. Uh, um, okay. There's just two reasons why the population of the panel will. 
Um, there, I said illegal hunting and uh, the process of reproduction is like not fast enough. Yeah. Okay. Good. So there's loads of different reasons you can give there. Those are two. Bible. Any questions there? No. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Grace, give me an answer for this. So basically, the toxins were present in the water, and fat tissues, fat, the fat cells have absorbed this, and it hasn't been broken down like fat tends to absorb things and it tends to store things. So it can, it's okay. still there, I guess. Okay, and how does it get from the water to the fat tissue? How does, how does you do it? How did it go from water to fat tissue? How did it work, sir? How did they get from the water to the way it was fat? Um, I don't know. So the key thing here is that they're actually taken up by the producers, so the phyloplankton, uh, and then, so let's just write this out. So DDT and PCBs are dumped into the water. And then you have phyloplankton. What is a producer? So a producer is, if you have like your food chain pyramid, you know, you might have like whales up here at the top. The producer is the plant or algae that's using photosynthesis to generate the energy. And then the consumers will eat them. Okay. That makes sense. So. EDT and PCBs are taken up by the phyloplankton and this is really where most of it enters the food chain because there's such a huge number of phyloplankton to make up this bottom rung of the pyramid. Um, they then get eaten by the whales and that's how the DDT gets from the consumer to the, uh, sorry, from the producer to the consumer and that's the process of bioaccumulation. And it, it's really important um, in terms of maintaining predator species because birds of prey have been put especially at risk from DDT. And since the ban of DDT in the 70s, those species have sort of recovered and they're no longer endangered. But yeah, you, you would still get the marks for that because there's so much you can talk about here and there's only two possible marks. So the fact that you said that ADT and PCBs are in the water and the fact that you said that they accumulate in fat are two valid answers and you get both marks for that. Okay. Panico, give me the answer for this. Oh, so I said, so sodium and iron can, so doesn't enter to the channel. So the impulses out of neurons uh, cannot transmit, like, through the bodies, I said. Okay, good. Um, so why does stopping um, sodium ions from entering the cell, why does that stop action potentials from happening? Um, because if, cause if you like, send to new ones, you need to like some channels and then you can, like, yeah. Okay, but what's, what's the role of the sodium channel specifically? Um, I thought just send new ones. Okay, so voltage gated sodium channel is important in if we remember the, the sort of graph where you have your action potential like that. The voltage gated sodium channels are very important for this part, the rising phase. Mm -hmm. And if you block this part, then what you get is just a flat line because you can't generate the rise that then starts the positive feedback mechanism that will give you this piece which is action potential. So if you block the voltage-gated sodium channels, you get no action potential. And if 
your neurons can't conduct action potentials, they can't function, then the whale will then be killed because it won't be able to move, it won't be able to eat, it won't be able to, um, you know, respire or do anything. Uh, does that make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Next question. Oh, sorry. Um, I said they are single-celled organisms. Good. Anything else you can say about them? The mark scheme says that they don't have flagella. Yeah. 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 But that's the other feature of the so that you can say. Uh, it's their their classification is a bit gray in that when they were first classified in the Five Kingdom scheme, they were simply called the eukaryotes that didn't fall into the animal plants or fungi classification. So, you know, the fact that they're unicellular and the fact that they have flagella kind of separates them from animal plants and fungi. Okay. All right. So, Kaneko, give me that for this one. So, the reduce is GP become TP. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. If I said um, that GP is converted to TP, is that fine? If I don't say reduced? Uh, you want it? No, I think you have to say reduced. You get one mark for noting the conversion, but the important part here is the reduction. Because they want you to be able to distinguish between reduction reactions and oxidation reactions. Okay. So, great second part. I actually didn't know this one. Okay, so how about you, Kaneko? Do you know it? Is it? Because I wasn't sure. So, like, I thought it because, like, in a, I, I think I'm wrong, but like, like, from Calvin Psycho and then. <laughs> There's like some NAD, um, NADP and TP become TP, so I thought it's going to be good. Okay, so in the plant itself, NADP is going to be used, okay? DCPIP is just uh, an artificial substance that's added in the experiment so that we can measure it, okay? If it can die, right? Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, do you want me to repeat that? Yes, okay, so in the plant, NADP is reduced, okay? Yeah. In this experiment, in this experiment, the Hill experiment, they use DCPIP as the sort of dye indicator. Mm -hmm. So if you have the dye being reduced, then the chloroplast can't reduce NADP. And if that's the case, so normally the concentration of RUBP is increased through the reduction of NADP, but if instead DCPIP is receiving all the reduction, then you don't get the conversion of RUBP. Does that make sense? So what you get is RUBP steadily decreasing because it's not regenerated through the reduction of NADP. And instead, you get the reduction of DCPIP and the color change. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, what I can do is, so do you guys have the um, Cambridge International textbook? Yeah. Because it's got a really good section on explaining this. And what I'll do is, at the end of this session, I'll just post on the Slack channel the exact, um, you know, Page that you can find, and then you can come back to it either next week or if you guys have any questions about this, you can just message it. Mm -hmm. so I'm happy so, to tell an explanation. So it's is it because in the so in the Calvin cycle to yeah. regenerate that RUBP you need an ADP. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's move on. So the next question, they use this experiment where 
you have tube A and you have tube B. Tube A is your control and tube B is the um, sort of reaction vessel, vessel that you have to measure into change in. Are you guys familiar with this experiment? Do you want me to talk you through it or are you guys happy to just take the answer? I think we've done it once, actually. Okay. Oh, done something, done something with the PID. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, can you talk to the question B, B? So, can you explain the reasons for the color standard tube? Uh, to compare to each different color, the way it works. Yeah, good. So this, is, this is your control. So, good. Let me, let me color to further the kind of change you see the control is going to be an obstacle there. So, they use two age compare as a sort of baseline. Does that make sense? Can you say it again? Sorry. I'm fine. So the color change to any color change is sort of just due to time and reaction the chloroplast the wavelength of light. And so if you have that and you also have the mixture decided and the other the effect of the reaction. Sorry, it's sort of cutting off in between. Okay. Like I'm sorry, I'll try it. I'll see if I can turn my mic one second. That's okay. Yeah. Right, is that better? That's better, yeah. Okay, good. So basically, in this reaction, you have tube A and you have tube B, right? Tube A has most the chloroplast, so all you're getting in tube A is some chloroplast, and they say that that is the color standard. Tube B is a mix of the dye with the chloroplast. So having both in the experiment, you can see how much the dye changes, changes the reaction that would have occurred anyway with just the chloroplast. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. So. What this asked is why you have this sort of color standard too. And that the answer for that is that it's a control. So it's a control. And controls are used to compare. If you didn't have two A, you wouldn't be able to say whether the color change is due to the chloroplast or the DCPIP or mixture. Does that make sense? And the and the second part of the question is why would you cover the beaker containing the mixture with oil? Give me an answer. Um uh, so that I wrote that so that DC PIP doesn't react with the light and the reduction takes place. Yeah, exactly. So if you if you didn't cover it with foil, then the reaction would take place and you wouldn't be able to start another and do your repetition. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, we can get for I here. Canical? Yeah. Two and two point two. Uh oh. so what what is T? What is mean for T? T. Oh. Yeah, so you're to get the answer to this question you need to use this equation. Yeah, so forty five. Yeah, perfect. And then the answer is 22. You both happy with that? Okay, great.
describe and explain the effect of light waves in the super rate of the light dependent state. Okay, so first I said that the purple light, which has a wavelength of 125 nanometers, has the fastest rate. And that the green light, and it gave its wavelength, has the slowest rate. Um, and then I talked about how green light, how the chlorophyll can't absorb the green light and can absorb the orange and purple light better. Good. That's all I wrote. Okay, and why, why does it seem purple and orange better? I thought it doesn't because it's green, which means, like, chlorophyll itself is green, which means it, it can absorb all other light except for green. But I don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. It, it, a degree absorbs all the wavelengths better than green. But, for instance, why would it absorb purple and orange better than, you know, blue? You know why? Because it's the opposite of green, if you look at the color wheel or something, maybe? Uh, not quite. The actual pigments, mm -hmm. which are absorbed in will have, will have an optimum absorbance frequency, all right? Yeah. Uh, and in, in green plants, there tend to be three different pigments. So you have chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and cantonoids, and sorry, carotenoids, and those accessory pigments, so other than chlorophyll A, B, will absorb in the other wavelength, so that's the, you know, blues and the reds that aren't the optimum, which is purple and orange, but it's sorry? still much more than green. Sorry, so you have, if I just put the numbers beside them, right? So this is 22.2. This is the most absorbed. Then it's this. Then it's this. Then it's this. So what this tells you is that purple is the best, and then orange, and then red, and then blue. And this is because the accessory pigments have can absorb those wavelengths better. Precisely. Yeah. And, and the whole, if you add all of these absorption spectra together, you get what's called an action spectrum, which looks something like that. Yeah. And so if you get the question, you want to mention the fact that there are different pigments and that the summed up absorption spectra of all the pigments is the photosynthetic action spectra. Okay. How could in the mark scheme the mentioning non-cyclic photophosphorylation? What does that have to do with the question? Uh, so, in the marking scheme, they talk about the actual way that photosynthesis occurs in the light dependent state. And so, they're just saying that if the student describes non-cyclic correlation, or if the student describes light as a selection, then they'll be for that. Hello? Yeah. Hi, did you get, did you get that from I heard some of it. Maybe, no. should we try, um, it could be our computer, actually. Okay. I will try something in a second. Okay.
Hello? Hi, is it better? Kanika is just going to go get her iPad. Because oh. we can try that, because it's, we can't only really see you. Okay, no problem. Are you joined in? Are you joined in? Are you playing? Come on. Don't know. I'm in this. Okay, we can continue this fine yeah. work. We can. Okay. We'll tr we'll keep trying with the iPad in a second to get. Sorry. Just just let me know when the iPad is set up. And okay. Then... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Um. Okay. So the next question you're talking about red squirrels and gray squirrels, and they give you some information here which should give you some clues as to how the competition between the two species um, arose uh, which kind of leads on to question a so grace what was your answer for question a i said that there aren't enough resources because they're being consumed by the gray squirrels and there's a virus which is being transmitted by the gray squirrels so through introducing this alien species, the grey squirrels, the red ones, have died out. Good. You'd get both marks for that. Any questions about that? Is that even though I haven't stated specifically competition, like interspecific competition? Yeah, no, you would still get the mark, but the reason they sort of underline interspecific competition in the answer scheme is that, you know, they're supposed to look for the students using the specific word competition. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe you would still get the mark for that because you sort of explain competition without saying it. But for the, like to be sure, I would always say competition when they're talking about causes of extinction. Competition should always be like you know one of the red flags that comes to your head. Okay. Thanks. Okay, describe how molecular similarity can be investigated. Hanukkah? Oh, um, I didn't know this one, but the, I know when they compare their DNA sequences, I don't know, like other two. Okay, well, how can you compare DNA sequences? Uh, like DNA base, like the polypeptide, I guess. Uh, okay, so polypeptides are different to DNA. Um, <laughs> if, so, you know, can you explain to me just the central dogma of, you know, genetics? So what does DNA code for? And just give me like one sentence to explain that. <laughs> like... Like in the information of genes. Uh, yeah, good. So the gene. What do what does that code for? Oh. Wait. Uh, I can't remember actually. So it's mRNA. Yeah. And what's that process called? So this is transcription. Yeah. And then what's the MRA, mRNA turned into? tRNA? No. So the next step uses tRNA for its <laughs> translation. Translation uses tRNA. Yeah. And mRNA into protein. And this is this is the central dogma of genetics. Okay, so you need to know this. And if you know this, it can help you answer loads of questions. 
Now, polypeptide is just another word for proteins. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so, in the answer scheme, when it says compare the polypeptide or amino acid sequences, it's saying that you can compare this side of the spectrum, right? Yeah. And it, another answer is to compare this side of the spectrum. So you can either compare the DNA to see molecular similarity, or you can compare the proteins or the amino acids which build up the protein. Okay. Now, you get another point for talking about specifically comparing the sequences. Mm -hmm. And sequences can be compared with different techniques. So you can use things like genetic fingerprinting. And DNA profiling. And other, you can talk about other sequencing methods and you get a point there. Um, and the last thing you can talk about is mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is only passed on from the mothers, and because of that, it retains this sort of, it, it, it retains a sort of fingerprint for the species, and because of that, you can compare it to the species. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Grace? So, red, are red squirrels maybe more used to the pine marten as they have lived there for longer and the two have learned how to coexist? And also that the red, the coat of the red squirrels may allow them to blend in more whilst the grey squirrels then stand out more. So now we're talking about soil bacteria, um, the proteins they produce, uh, and it's sort of we're sort of looking at insecticide proteins, right? Insecticide proteins kill insects, and this question is looking at cotton that can be genetically modified to produce this insecticide. Um, so, question one then, Kanako, can you talk me through the advantages of using the Tri-1-AC from another tri -protein? So, the, the Tri-1-AC does not harm butterflies. <laughs> I said the uh, so like the cry one of AC, you can act more like specifically than the, the protein one? Yeah, good. So it's the, the answer is right there in the question. This protein acts specifically to kill um, all of these things, right? Um, and what does what does that term specifically mean? Sorry? What does the term specifically mean? Sorry. So like not kill like all insects or something i don't know yeah good it, it's more than that it means that it will only kill the larvae of butterflies and moths so it won't kill other developmental stages of the butterflies and the moths it won't kill other insects it'll only kill the larvae of butterflies and moths okay. why might that be useful why might you only want to kill the larvae of butterflies and all. Why? Yeah, why why do you want a specific protein that only kills specifically the larvae of butterflies and all? I don't know, because you don't want to harm like other insects. Yeah, good. So why might you not want to harm other insects? Uh, I don't know. Grace, do you know the answer? So, you don't want to, in general, you don't want to hunt insects, on, like, necessarily to maintain biodiversity. 
bird. And so pollinators to be able to reproduce as a plant. You yeah. Don't... Yeah. So pollinators are important specifically for the plant ecosystem as well. If you get rid of your pollinators, then it would be very difficult for the plant to reproduce. So not only are you protecting biodiversity, but you're also protecting the crop. So it's really important that you only kill the serious pests and you leave the potential organisms that actually aid the crop. Um, okay, good. Uh, there's one other point you can pick up here, and it's the idea that cry one AC uh, versus other cry proteins actually kills the larvae of butterflies and moths, and perhaps other cry proteins aren't involved in that kill. Um, because at the start it says slightly different types of cry proteins which are toxic to insects. Um, certain cry proteins may be much less toxic than others. Okay. Great. Explain why a promoter is included in the genetic package. Um, I said, I wasn't sure if they meant if they were actually using a plasmid in a bacteria, but I did apply it to that. So I said, when the plasmid is entered, inserted into, for example, I said, when the vector is inserted into, for example, a bacteria, the gene must be switched on first in order for the protein to be transcribed. Um, that therefore a promoter is added, which tells the bacteria um, where to bind to and which strand to use and under which circumstances the gene should be, allowing, allowing the gene to be transcribed under, under certain circumstances. Okay, you, I'm happy with your understanding of promoter. That's all correct. But um, in terms of the confusion with whether they're talking about bacteria or not, um, mm -hmm. have another read of the question and then tell me what you think. They said they're using it in a genetic package. Yeah, okay. So they're getting the cry protein from this bacteria. But what we're actually talking about is modified cotton. So cotton is plant. We're not talking about bacteria here. We're talking about plant cells. We're getting the gene from bacteria, but we're putting them into plant cells. Mm -hmm. So. It's not, you know, your typical lab experiment where you're putting a plasmid into a bacteria. Instead, you're creating a plasmid or a genetic package and you're putting it into a plant cell. So, do you understand that? Okay, so we're not, we are taking, we're taking a plasmid from a bacteria, but we're putting that plasmid into this cotton, into this plant directly. Yeah, exactly. And it might not, so they've said genetic package, it might not be specifically a plasmid, you know, a plasmid being a circular piece mm -hmm. of DNA that's often found in bacteria. It could be something like a plasmid. So when we want to transfect eukaryotic cells, often we use reagents that punch holes in the cells and just, we can then just deliver linear DNA into it. Or there's there's basically a whole load of different protocols you can use. You don't necessarily need to put all of these things on a plasmid, but you do need to put them on a piece of DNA. And that's why they call it a genetic package instead of calling it a plasmid. Can um, I call it a vector? Yeah, vector. It's vector is another word they could use to describe it. So it's definitely a vector and it could be a plasmid. Um Plasmids, plasmids technically are used by stuff like bacteria and yeast. They can very easily, you know, use their polymerase on a promoter in a plasmid that's outside of the nucleus. But when you're talking about plants, the genetic package that you want to be transcribed and translated usually has to enter the nucleus and it usually has to integrate into the plant's genome, so it's not technically a plasmid in that sense. Okay. But other than that, you get the points for describing how the promoter works. Um, and are you happy with that? 
Yeah, that makes more sense. Okay, good. Um, Kaneko, explain to me why they put the herbicide resistance gene in. Why? Um, I know you do like to play hard size on the plants. But so, so what does a herbicide do? Like kill plants. Yeah, good, perfect. So if you have normal cotton and you add herbicide, you kill it, it dies. Mm. If you have cotton with herbicide, but you also have herbicide resistance team, the cotton survives. Mm. Now, if you are performing an experiment and you have a petri dish that you might be trying to grow some of these seeds on and you add it in your vector mm -hmm. and you performed your protocol to get the induction so induction protocol some of the cotton in your petri dish might take in your vector, and I've drawn them as black dots here, and some you might have failed just by chance. Yep. Drawing as token. Now, if you have, if you have this situation, and you always have this situation, you never have a hundred percent success rate. You always have some plant cells that either don't take in the vector or don't take in the whole vector. Um, then you want to somehow kill all of the ones that have failed. And so you can add a herbicide at this step. And if you add the herbicide, you'll knock out everything that hasn't taken in the vector because they don't have the herbicide resistance. Gene. And all your left are the plant cells that have taken in the vector. And you can say if they have herbicide resistance, and they'll also have the promoter and the try DNA gene. That make sense, guys? Yeah. Okay, let's move on then. So, this table shows information on the cultivation of cotton and non GM cotton. And um, what we're looking at is different different figures. So these each of these things have different units. And the units are here in the heading of the table. So the yield is different between the GM and the non GM. The cost is different. The insecticide cost is therefore different and the net income is therefore different. So so, so this, this table, where are the costs involved in growing this genetically modified cotton with the long Sorry, did you ask us something? Yeah, sorry. It's just something like that bad. I'll, I'll, I'll try and get a new one. Um, sorry, uh, my question was, can you answer this for me? Yeah. Um, well, I wrote that it costs 433 rupees more to buy the seeds for the BT cotton and that it costs 348 less for the insecticide for the BT cotton and that there is a net income of 865 rupees more for BT cotton. Good. You get the marks for that. Even though I haven't said that there's the total cost is more for BT, like the total upfront cost. Yeah, no, you would still get the mark because you you've given different points regarding the um, the cost of BT versus non GM, and you've manipulated the data. Okay, cool. Still get the mark because remember, in the answer scheme, they've given three potential marks you can get, but you can only get up to two. Mm -hmm. 
So even if you don't tick all of those boxes, you'll still get full marks for that question. Okay. Um, okay, next one. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, so non GM cotton is cheaper than VT cotton? Yeah. Can I, if I said I wrote that the costs up front are higher for, so like that they have, you have to put in more, even though you get more out of um, making BT cotton, the costs, to, you have to have the cash up front in order to do that. Like you have to have more cash up front. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's correct. That, you would get the mark for that. That's a valid point. Okay. Okay, great. Can you answer this? Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, let's see. Okay. Um, I said that using artificial selection, so if you breed together um, the BT cotton survivors of the drought and then cross breed the, the children survivors um, from two, of, two, different, two different breedings, you will be able to. Oh yeah, that by choosing plants that survive the drought, you'll be choosing um, plants with the most advantageous alleles to be able to survive these conditions. Yeah, good. And the, the key part here is you're not only crossing BT cotton that grows well in drought, but you're also selecting offspring which also grow well in drought. Mm -hmm. So not only are you choosing the crosses, but from the offspring, you then selecting the one on the genotypes and you cross them again. Now we take a five minute break there, guys. Sounds yeah. good. Cool. We'll see you in five minutes. Okay. Bye.
that's not the question that was uh, in the other like, part two. Hello? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kanako, you give me the answer for this. <sighs> okay. Uh... <laughs> So actual potential, it happened at nozzle Fabina. I don't know how to say. <laughs> and wait, and I know actual potential jump from like nose to nose. Good. I like, kind of like socket. I uh, maybe not. And. So I would see it's around which part of the new one? The mm, my like chest. Yeah, so if I drew a neuron for you guys, so here's the cell body with the nucleus. Here are some dendrites. Mm -hmm. Here is the axon. Which part of the neuron have a myelin sheet. Sorry, which part of the neuron has a myelin sheet? Oh my gosh, don't go <laughs> So the myelin sheet is found around the axon and it's found around the dendrite. Yes. And if you zoom in on the axon, yep. we have the body of the axon like this. So, which parts are the nodes of Ron here? Are the nodes the parts with myelin or the parts without myelin? The middle. The ones without myelin. Okay. Yeah. These are the nodes of Ron VA. Um, and you're telling me that action potential jump from node to node. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So what's happening here is that the action potential is generated here. So here's where you have loads of the voltage gated sodium channel that we talked about. Yeah. They they start off the peak, which causes positive feedback, and you get the action potential generated here. Mm -hmm. uh, myelin is a very fatty substance. It insulates the axon, so it stops the electricity from dissipating. Mm -hmm. So normally, the, the current wants to dissipate out of the sides of the axon. But because of the myelin, that's blocked. So instead of going out of the axon, the current goes along the axon. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of jumping that I was talking about. So it jumps from a node where it can dissipate to another node where it can dissipate. Um, and so the important parts that you want to, the important points that you want to get here is that nodes which allow depolarization. Uh, you have jumping, so as you said. And what's what's the technical name for that? Technical name for the jumping? Yeah. Saltatory conduction. Good. Saltatory. Uh, and then you get the further points by saying this makes conduction faster. And you guys understand how it makes it faster? Yep. Good. Yep. Um, and that allows you to have longer circuit where you're conducting it. And what do you mean by longer circuits? So I'm talking about the length of the axon. So even with uh, myelin sheet, if you didn't have the nodes of Rondier, you had a really long myelin sheet, also long axon. Eventually, the electric 
current will have dissipated into the myelin. Even though it's a good insulator, it can't insulate for a huge distance. So what you can, even though the myelin is a very good insulator, it can't insulate for a huge distance. So what you get, if you looked at the, if you were recording, so if I put a recording electrode here, and I put a recording electrode here, and here, and then back here in the next node, I'll draw you what each of the currents will look like. So at the first node, you get something like this. And then here, you measure a peak that is somewhere a little bit lower than the original one. And then here, you'd get another peak that's a little bit lower. Oh, so if like, you're saying if the myelin sheath was too long, you'd have eventually no peak. So no circuit would be set up. Yeah, exactly. No. And the, the important part here is the threshold, guys. So yeah. no matter how low it gets, by the time it gets to the next node of Ranvier, it's still over the threshold, which causes the positive feedback and it restarts at the top. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this is because, so if you don't have my, the myelin sheath, you'll just have, will you also have a decrease? You would have the same um, peak, right, throughout because the exact same current is, is induces the next sort of, do you yeah. So the, the problem is, of any myelin, as soon as the ions come in at this point and allow you to get this peak, they dissipate very quickly back out of the axon. So the ions will go straight out again before they get the opportunity to cause a depolarization in the next part of the membrane. Um, why does that only occur with the myelin sheath? So the myelin sheath, you can think about it as trapping the ions inside the length of the axon itself. So if the when you have an ionic gradient, it will try and dissipate in every direction it possibly can. So if we took we looked at it in a sort of 3D kind of structure like this, the ions want to go out by the path of least resistance. And because the myelin sort of covers the axon itself, then these directions are not the path of least resistance. Instead, it's the direction through the axon itself. The, the path of least resistance is to go along the neuron. Yeah, if, if there's myelin. If there yeah. is myelin, then the path of least resistance is just to leave the axon straight through radially. Does that make sense? So to go through, not to actually go out through the myelin, but to go through the axon. Yeah, exactly. So just mm -hmm. to leave out the side of the axon. And, you go and that's what leads to these lessening curves. Like that's yeah. because exactly. how is some of how us so some ions are lost. Some ions do do leave. Exactly. Yeah, because. While myelin is a good insulator, it's not a perfect insulator. Okay. Um, and if you didn't have myelin, sorry, you would have, because you'd have all of, you'd have the same peak over and over again. No, you wouldn't have the same peak over and over again. So um, let me see if I can erase this. Um, so... So, in the situation where we don't have any myelin, we just have an axon like this. Let's say here's the axon hillock. So the body of the neuron is here. So we get summation of that of the potentials coming into this neuron. And then all of this, so you have loads of sodium channels here in the hillock, so loads of channels which allow you to generate the axon. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it starts moving this way along the axon, the ions will start to move out of the axon radially. So what you have is the next portion 
the next portion of the iPhone, so if we look at the potential here, it would actually be much lower because of the amount of... That can actually leave? Okay, I get it. Yeah. So that makes sense. And that means that the action potential might only go, you know, halfway along the axon and never actually reach its target. Okay. So and, it's so much, so important to have an Yeah. And so in, in demyelinating conditions, such as multiple sclerosis, what you have is a steady reduction in that myelin until you get a situation where your axons can't properly send impulses. And that results in paralysis and severe enough to get respiratory paralysis and that will be bad. Okay, let's do the next question. Can you describe this to um, so I wrote, when an action potential reaches the presynaptic membrane, calcium tupac, calcium ion channels are stimulated to open, calcium ions flood the presynaptic membrane and cause vesicles containing acetylcholine to move towards the presynaptic membrane and fuse with it, and for that ATP is needed, then by exocytosis the con contents of the vesicles are then are emptied into the synapse. Okay. So just a couple of points there. You said that the calcium channels are stimulated to open when the action potential arrives at the synapse. What do you mean by stimulated? What is actually causing the calcium channels to open? Well, I'm, they're voltage gated as well. So if the action potential has reached the presynaptic, and then uh, that 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 space, the end, that some whatever the terminal, uh, it's creating a voltage. So that voltage, like it has been doing before in the axon, and that voltage then causes the calcium channel voltage gated channels to open. Yeah, perfect, good. Um, and everything else you said is correct. When you said it causes the neurotransmitter to be released. How how is acetylcholine actually released from the vesicles into the cyanide? So are they just they're just empty? I mean, like the membrane, the the vesicle, the membrane of that vesicle fuses with the membrane of the this presynaptic membrane, and then the contents sort of like just spill out. Don't Good. And what's what's that process of membrane fusion called? Is it not exocytosis? Yeah, good, perfect. It's exocytosis. So make sure you use that word when you're describing the release. Okay. But, should, should I be saying, is it okay to say that the calcium channels are stimulated to open, or should I be explaining? Uh, you can say it, but it's vague. I would prefer to say, like, even if you don't want to go into the full explanation, say that the depolarization causes voltage gated calcium channels to open. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, kind of cool. Next question. So, we're looking at another experiment here. Um, so, we've taken mitochondria, put them in dishes, and added substances to them, and then checked for the presence of ATP after a period of time. So, basically, what Peter Mitchell was doing was seeing which substances he had to add. Well, first of all, he was seeing whether the mitochondria actually produced ATP. And second of all, he was seeing which substances he had to add and what concentration to actually cause ATP generated. And so in this question, they've given us four possible dishes. And they've said, you, you know, added all of these different things. And you're supposed to tell me whether or not ATP is reduced. So, Panico, can you talk me through this? So the first one is yes. Yeah. And why? Why is it correct? <laughs> is it because like in a oh, what's it called? Electron transport chain. Yeah. <laughs> and. And then you got hydrogens and 
and I thought and ADP and P and I just remember it's happening in a, in a, in a pre-sale, there's an actual transport chain and they produce ATP, does it? Yeah, good, okay, so that's fine. Um, you're right, this is the standard way that ATP is produced by the electron transport chain. So okay, I'll have the acetyl CoA feeding into the star and oxygen is used at the end. Um, we can talk about whole explanation in a second when we go through the rest of them, but tell me about the second, third, and fourth. Then. Or is ATP produced in any of these? They don't produce ATP. Uh, yeah, so no ATP is produced in the second. How about the third? No, no. And how about the fourth? They do produce ATP. Okay. And why is ATP produced with high concentrations of glucose? Because in a matrix, they need high concentration of proteins, then you can like kind of like pump out of AT, uh, hydrogen ion, I guess. Okay, but why, how can you do it without adding oxygen? Without oxygen? Yeah, so in this fourth dish, Peter Mitchell didn't add oxygen, but he still got ATP to do Ow. Grace, have you got any idea? How we can do that last one without oxygen? Yeah. Is it with anaerobic respiration? Not quite. I mean, this is we're we're talking about isolated mitochondria here, so you know it could be anaerobic respiration if you had the whole cell and the machinery required to do anaerobic respiration, but. The answer to that question is that there will be residual oxygen in the case anyways, even though he hasn't added oxygen. There will be enough oxygen to produce a little bit of ATP before more oxygen is needed. And because he has this high concentration of protons, he can drive ATP synthase at a really high rate with whatever oxygen is left in the dish when he's done his isolation. That makes sense. So, I actually just assumed that there would be oxygen. I don't know why, but um, so. But how come then mitochondria plus ADP plus PI plus acetyl CoA doesn't also just assume that there is some oxygen left over? Okay, so you assume that there's a tiny bit of oxygen, but the problem with having as like acetyl CoA instead of high concentration of proteins. Having acetyl CoA means that that's the only thing that can be fed into the chain at the start. But with a high concentration of protons, the mitochondria can use all sorts of different molecules at the start of the chain and you wouldn't necessarily need them added in. But if you only have acetyl CoA and you haven't put a high concentration of protons to drive ATP synthase, then you'll get a tiny amount of ATP being produced. So this is a cross. Technically, you would have, like, I'm talking trace amounts of oxygen, but to get that trace up to an actual measured, measurable amount, you would need a high concentration of protons to drive ATP synthase and literally scavenge any substrate that can be fed into the electron transport. Mm -hmm. I'm still a bit confused. Sorry. Okay. I mean, how about I'll I'll just type I'll write out an explanation and that sounds um, good. Um, that sounds good. Also, why? Because acetyl CoA, you might have said this, but I'm not sure. Acetyl. The second the second point there. That's part of the um, Krebs cycle. So. Why does oxygen? Why is oxygen even needed? Because oxygen isn't oxygen only needed as a final electron acceptor in the oxidative. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, or are they talking about like for the link reaction, you need ATP, which requires oxygen? The important part here is that we're, we've only isolated mitochondria. We don't have whole cells here, 
And so to get glycolysis to this PPP, you need other cytoplasmic machinery, not just mitochondria. So this function would produce ATP if you had the whole cell with the cytoplasm and all of the enzymes in the cytoplasm to go through glycolysis. Have the reaction and the you know the oxidative phosphorylation you need more than just alcohol. I'll, I'll write out an explanation for the time. So okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next one then. So, water will osmose into the mitochondrial matrix, and this will, I wrote, this will upset the concentration gradients, resulting in various ions diffusing in. Um, which may lead to H plus ions leaving due to the influx of other ions and that the mitochondria might best. Yeah, okay, you get the marks for that, that's fine. Um, obviously in the marking scheme, they don't go with that kind of net, but by all means, um, okay. so Next one. Uh... Or uh, the electron acceptor? Yeah, good. It's the final electron acceptor. So what's what's the role of oxygen? And what, by accepting the final electron, what does it do? What does it do? Uh, um, I don't know. I didn't just like diffuse electron to matrix or... Uh, no, Grace, you know what it does? So it forms water with the proton side coming through the ATP synthase? Yeah, exactly. So that the energy is used to split the oxygen molecule and form more water. Uh, so you, you get them all for just saying that. Uh, okay. Grace, maybe I'm not used to it. ATP synthesis. Good. Hey, Kaneko, can you explain this question? Oh, so in the cluster, they have electron transport chain and hydrogen pumps into not matrix into inner membrane, I guess. Yeah. And after that day, that and that oxidative phosphorylation happened. So, so hydrogen ion diffused to matrix and ADP and P1 produce ATP. Yeah, okay, good. So you said that you have your outer membrane and then you have your inner membrane and you told me that this is the site of the transportation. Okay, that's correct. Um, and that it moves photons. Now, why do protons then What causes protons to be inside? Sorry, I can't. What, what is the driving force that moves protons back through the inner membrane? Possibly a there. So this whole process is called oxidative phosphorylation. But this step where hydrogen is pumped through ATP synthase, what drives that? Like diffusion. Yeah, good. And why is high, why are protons diffusing back in? Oh. So the key is this step here, right? You're creating a gradient. So here you're going to have yeah. a really high concentration. 
a low concentration. And as soon as ATP sends things to the different sites of the ions, they'll get pumped back in. And that drives the conversion to form the H2. But that's good. The rest of your points you get the, the rest of the points you're gonna get the points for. Um right guys, shall we take another five minute break before the last half hour? Cool. Yeah. I will back. Maybe he's not back. Yeah, actually, here we go. It's only Q3, right? Is it on? Mm -hmm. It's on. Actually, I was thinking if I can get question 8, part 2 sorted, I might not go to the last class. Because if it's Alan, He's just going to like, you know, okay, yeah. That's do all true. the questions and if I've already gone through all of them. If it was Morton, like, he'd ask me to do like, it. Can we do, like, ask me anything type stuff? With him? With yeah. Him. Hi, guys. That's a better idea. Hi. Hi, again. Um, you guys, are you guys ready to continue or do you want to do something else? I, I kind of overheard you guys as I was coming back. Um, no, we're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, I am happy to change the format. I have no problem at all. Oh, no, no, no we're not talking, talking about you. We're talking yeah. about Matt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about Matt. <laughs> please don't don't think that I'll take it personally. Like, I'm... I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> we tell you, don't worry. We just have, like, very... We have very different, different maths teachers. And depending on who we have... <laughs> we will either be questioned or we will like not be questioned at all. Okay, all right, no problem. Yeah, don't worry, you're, you're fine. Okay. Um, all right, let's get back to it then. So, um, this next question talking about rare genetic disease where you get um, a buildup of galactose, which kind of just causes multi organ failure. Um, and it's caused by a recessive mutation in this. Um, 
So, first of all, then, Tanako, can you suggest to me how a person with galactosemia can minimize damage to the liver, kidney, and brain? So, like, just don't drink milk? Like... Yeah, perfect, good. So, the whole problem with this is that they take in milk, which has the lactose, and then that just ends up, so you normally have an enzyme which breaks it down, but if you knock that out, you get the galactosemia. Okay, so that's pretty simple. If you don't want galactosemia, just don't drink milk uh, for somebody who has that problem. Um, okay, great. So bigger question now. Explain how the mutation could result in a change in the enzyme responsible for the metabolism of galactose. Okay, this might be a bit messy, but I wrote through a base addition, deletion, or substitution, a different base, a different base sequence will occur. Can occur when transcribing enzymes. Um, these so proteins, these no, three base pairs, three base nucleotides code for one amino acid. If through a mutation, the combination of three base pairs changes a different amino acid will be added to the chain um, or you could have a frame a frame shift may even occur where a base addition or a deletion happens possibly changing all the following amino acids in the polypeptide chain. by changing the amino acids you change you may by changing the amino acids in the polypeptide chain you may change the shape of the enzymes active site which is determined by the primary structure. Um, and then I went on to talk about how the tertiary structure is held together by different bonds, which are dependent on which amino acids you have. Okay. Yeah, okay, good. You, you get the marks there. I'm happy with your explanation. But you said that the active site is determined by the primary structure. Can you elaborate a bit on that for me? What do you mean by the active site is? So the active site of the enzyme, so the shape of it, um, and the shape of that depends on the enzyme structure. So primarily, like first of all, on the primary structure, which will determine the tertiary structure. Yeah, okay. So the point I'm trying to get at, I, I'm sure you understand it, but the point I'm trying to get at is that for the active site, it's part of the enzyme's 3D and that's directly determined by tertiary okay. structure. And so tertiary structure dictates 3D shape, which dictates the shape of the active site. And the point that you were getting at, I believe, is that um, is that primary structure dictates secondary structure, which dictates tertiary structure in that sort of way. So if you change primary structure in a roundabout way, you'll then change the active site. Um, but just the reason I sort of uh, elaborate that point is that if you're saying primary structure dictates active site, then the examiner doesn't necessarily know that you understand that it's, you know, via all these steps. Yeah. Uh, so just be careful with your wording there. I mean, otherwise, it's all correct. And even if the examiner thought that that wasn't clearly enough, you still pick up all the marks for making all the other points correctly. Okay? Okay, thank you. All right, um, Hanako, can you explain this one to me then? So, uh, okay. I Joe, so. That's okay. So we <laughs> said, so the, the important fact that you need to take from the question itself, that it said that gall, the gene, is recessive. Mm -hmm. Okay. They didn't talk about sex length or autosomal, but you can you, what you can do is assume that it's autosomal and then look at these numbers and if it makes sense then 
you know, you can go with the assumption that it's going to be. Yep. And now, if the, I think the easiest way to do this kind of thing is to just draw a cross out for each one. So if you had the parent one was unaffected, so I'm going to write you know, the recessive is going to be a middle G and the dominant is going to be a big G. So if this person's unaffected, they're going to be B, G. And if this person's a car carrier, they're going to be big G, little G. And just draw out your table. Yep. And so you've got two people who are unaffected and two people who are carriers. And that kind of makes sense here, right? 50% unaffected. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Good. And then you just do it for all of the rest of them. Um, do you have answers for these? Uh, so, for instance, if it was carrier versus carrier, you would have BG, BG, and you would uh, But you get what I mean? You would yeah, yeah, yeah for each one and you just count them mm -hmm. uh, one one of one phenotype is 25 percent two of phenotypes is percent etc 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 you should get 25 25 are you guys happy with that yeah okay good. okay great can you answer this for me no. What? Can, can you answer this for me? Uh, no, I couldn't answer it. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Um, all right. So, testing for galactosemia is usually carried out on newborn babies, uh, although it's possible to carry out the test on a fetus. Are you both happy with the concept of, you know, fetus versus newborn babies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fetus in the mother, in the uterus, and newborn baby is very easy to, you know, just sample blood from, et cetera, et cetera. But because the fetus is in the mother, it can be difficult to test for galactic Um However, there are ways of testing a fetus for genetic diseases or, you know, any sort of genetic uh, genotype. And the way you do this is by somehow getting people uh, cells. So the first point here is that you have to obtain fetal cells. Now, do you know any method that you can do to get fetal cells from a pregnant? So if you have a mother who is pregnant, how would you get fetal cells from her? Um, I don't know. Okay, so you basically have two options here, um, and this kind of makes the second point that you can pick up. Either amniocentesis, which is literally if you, if you were to draw a mother, if you imagine this is the silhouette of a pregnant mother, you just stick a syringe into the uterus and you withdraw a sample of the amniotic fluid. And you get the amniotic fluid and you look at it, you can either look at it under the microscope and sort out fetal cells, other cells, or you can use more advanced um, technological ways to basically sort out the fetal cells versus the other cells. You get fetal cell sample, and then you can see that, okay? The other, the other type of sampling is chorionic sampling, and this is done in a similar way, so you're sampling, you can sample via injection. Uh, the chorionic villus is part of the wall of the um, uterus where the placenta is. So if you have like, the uterus looks like this, 
and here you have the, the center, here you have the, the baby inside, um, and you have an umbilical cord that kind of connects the, connects to the baby. The chorionic villi is here, and this is where you sample. And again, a fetal cell sample, and you see it here. Um, in the marking scheme, they've added another point where you know you can pick up a further point um, by saying something about electrophoresis plus probe. You know what they mean by that? Um, I know how electrophoresis works. Okay, tell me what electrophoresis is. How does it work? So it's basically where you have a setup where you have one a positive a cathode and an anode and you have this um tray i guess in between with different wells and you have a gel in it so it uh, tends to be there are different types of gels and you can put dna fragments into 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 this gel and they will they will move they will all move towards the towards one side yeah yeah, and by doing that, like the sm the faster ones, the the DNA fragments that are the smallest and have the highest density ch sort of charge will move the furthest, and through that you can um you can separate out sections of DNA. Okay, good. And uh, you know how you might then find a mutation using electrophoresis. Then, like through. After that, putting it through um, genetic fingerprinting. Okay, what do you mean by genetic fingerprinting? Yeah. Is that where you have like, um, so where you then take an absorbent paper and you put it over your sort of electrophoresis thing and then you have, um, you get these lines, these like. Yeah, okay. So you could use that. So when they are when they say probe, what they're specifically talking about, um, I'll try and draw out for you guys. So let's talk about it in the context of this experiment. So we've got. Um, uh, so we've done amniocentesis or CV sampling. From that, we have our fetal cells. And from them, we extract the DNA. Right? And this is the start of our experiment. The experiment starts with the DNA. Now, what you can do is you can use, you can use electrophoresis on the DNA. Um, what you do is put your gel here. Let's say you've broken up the D using enzymes, you've broken up the DNA, which probably, you know, a few weeks long, many thousands of millions of base, base, uh, base pairs long. You use an enzyme to break them down into four smaller lengths of DNA, which can then process using electrophoresis. And you might already have an idea where the gold gene is found, but the, uh, sorry, that was not responding. Uh, but the gold gene is where you're looking for when you start doing your electrophoresis. And so you have different wells, and you might have a sample well, which is the one you want to test, and then you might have two controls: positive control that you know has the EALT disease for certain. So it could be the mother of the baby uh, or the father of the baby if they definitely have the condition or if they're definitely a carrier. And then here you have a negative control where you know the person doesn't have the EALT recessive phenotype. Okay? So we have three wells. And we've put the DNA of the three different things we're testing in each of the wells. And as you said, you start running current and the DNA will basically streak. You get streaks of DNA through the gel, like this, for each of them. 
And they look like they look like just a sort of rectangular street. If you then put a piece of paper that has a probe on it, so by probe, what I mean is a piece of complementary DNA, which is specifically complementary to the GALT gene. So if our GALT gene, I'll grossly simpl uh, simplify it, but if the GALT gene was just B, C, 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 A, then our complementary DNA probe would be a fluorescent tag attached to C, C, A, C, A, C. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we put that fluorescent tag all over this absorbent paper, and then we lay it on top of this. And then what you get is the parts of DNA that correspond to the gold genes, so let's say it's here and here, in the positive people, but not here, the negative. And you then take the absorbent paper off, and you process that, what you might see is something like this. And that way, you know that the sample for the baby is positive for adult or has that. Okay. Makes sense. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Any questions? Yeah, about that technique or anything about galactosemia? Mm, not for no. me right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on then. Um, all right, Grace, can you answer this question? Homeostasis, negative feedback, outline how negative feedback works. Yeah. So I said when um, something deviates from the set point, receptor cells detect this and are stimulated, they then send this information by neurons to the brain, so to the control center. The control center then, by neurons, sends instructions to an effector cell to do something to counteract this change. Effector cells may be muscles or glands. Okay. So you've got, you've got it all right, um, up to the point where your effector is sort of doing something. You said that change happens, receptor detects it, and then via, you know, nerves or hormones, you saw an effector. What specifically does the effector do? It does something so that, so to counteract this change, so that the sets are, whatever deviated from the set point returns to the set point. Good. And how does it do that? Sorry? How, how does it counter the change? Um, so it might, for example, it might, if you're cold, you might um, start shivering. So. Okay, good. The point I'm trying to get at is that all of these negative feedback mechanisms are again mediated by cellular communication. So in some way, the effector mechanism will involve either a nerve, um, nerve impulse oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Or, you know, hormones or other kinds of transmitters, right? Yeah. So they kind of these are kind of the, the machinery that used by the receptors and the effectors to just change the whatever's measured, so the parameter back to that. So good. You get full marks anyways because you hit the first four points. The only part that you missed is that last part that kind of ties together like that. The effect of that is usually okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go to the next one. Okay, so we're looking at blood glucose homeostasis here and the mechanisms by which blood glucose can decrease. Um, so they've told you that the hypothalamus can detect blood glucose. They've told you that it then signals these different pancreatic cells. Sorry, they tell us that the hypothalamus detects? Uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, okay, maybe that's my inference from knowing that, but um, by seeing here that the hypothalamus controls 
in the cell, out the cells, but you know, are the sort of. You know, didn't we talk about last time that the hypothalamus that it was the beta and the alpha cells that detect the change? Um, did I say that? Okay, I might have I might have confused myself. Apologies, but the beta. And, so if you're looking at a really like in depth look at the beta cells and the alpha cells, they are able to detect uh, changes to an extent, mm -hmm. but most of the detection does come from the hypothalamus. Okay. Apologies, I, I might have got that wrong when I was explaining it to you. Um, but yeah, so the hypothalamus will detect the changes and that's how it is sort of the central control system for the effector gland. So here we've got the sensor and here we've got the Um, and then insulin, glucagon, and adrenaline, adrenaline are all hormones which do the testing. Um, okay. So, with reference to figure one, describe the role of the nervous system in the control of blood glucose concentration. So, Hanako, can you give me your answer to that? So, for that question, so when the blood glucose concentration increased, beta beta cells send insulin. Yeah, beta cells will increase insulin. That's correct. And when the blood glucose concentration decreases, and then alpha cells send glucagon, and then your blood glucose back to normal. Okay, good. So you talked about beta cells and alpha cells. What's the other effector in the diagram of both? Uh, uh, the adrenal glands. Yeah, good. And when when is the when are the adrenal glands stimulated? And what situation do you have found this stimulated here? Is it when the blood glucose concentration is like really high? Uh, no, so it's when the blood glucose concentration is really low because remember, adrenaline, which is the effect. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. So here we've got low blood glucose. Okay, you told me what happens when you have low blood glucose or high blood glucose. Um, is there any other situation when adrenaline might be used by the adrenal glands? Sure. When, when, other than having low blood glucose, when might adrenaline be released by the adrenal glands? Under what situation? Is it because like adrenaline can change the like, rate of metabolism reaction? Yeah, adrenaline can affect that, but what I'm asking is so you told me hypo the hypothalamus can detect a decrease in blood glucose and it can cause adrenaline to be released. Yes. Yeah. Other than a decrease in blood glucose, what other situation? Cause the hypothalamus to signal to the adrenal glands to release adrenaline. The point I'm getting at here is in states of stress. So if an animal is under stress, mm -hmm. that causes adrenaline to be released as well. Okay. And that's mediated by neurons that connect from the brain to the hypothalamus. So since we have adrenaline as the final effector hormone being released, releasing the adrenal gland, the adrenal glands are connected to the hypothalamus. And you can have low blood glucose, 
which is sent by the hypothalamus via blood flow. You can have stress, which is sent by the hypothalamus by nerve impulses in the brain. Okay? Yeah. Um, now we... All right, let's do this last question. And if you guys want, you can... Uh, photograph and send me the last two questions, and I can give you guys more stuff. If we if we send you our last question, yeah, I can I can mark it for you. That would be cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, but let's just finish this one then. Great, can you answer this? Um. So with vasoconstriction, less heat is lost by the bloodstream, and um. Blood vessel as the blood vessels get narrower, narrower, and they get they go further away from the surface of your skin, so the heat is lost. For shivering, I wrote that the muscles contract, leaving uh, muscles contract, which increases their kinetic energy and therefore um, heat. You get warmer, um, and then increase the last one increases heat energy as more metabolic. Uh, Reactions are taking place. The liver turns glycogen into glucose, which provides the body with more energy. Good. Yeah. Perfect. All right. That makes sense. Um, all right. So for these last two questions, uh, you guys, what you could do is just photo, like use your phones, and just photo your answers and send them to me, and I can just send them back. Would that suit you guys? Yeah, that, that sounds good. If you want, if you're happy with it and you you know you've looked at the marking scheme and you're fine with it, you don't have to. But if you'd like some feedback, please send them to me, and I'll give you a, write a little bit of a um, a little bit of feedback for you on this. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and in the meantime, I'll just write up a bit of an explanation for that. Uh, was it the correlation question? Was there any other question that you guys wanted to maybe write up a point? Um, no, I think we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Cool. Uh, Bye. Bye.